Fihaurie Skoworoda was an 18th century philosopher, poet and composer of religious music. A number of his writings can be found in his songs, several of which have been adapted to Ukrainian folk music. Skoworoda's work contributed to the culture of both Russia and Ukraine. He has been called Socrates, both as a moralist and one whose Socratic style is intended to stimulate thought and self-introspection. At the same time, Skavoroda's writings are imaginative, witty and dramatic, with themes that highlight happiness and appreciation of life. Skavoroda did not seek to have his work published while he was still alive. He was more concerned with living in a manner true to the moral values upheld in his writings. Three days prior to his death, Skovoroda went to stay with one of his closest friends. Each day he left the house and it was discovered that he was digging his own burial place beneath the tree. On the third day, he announced that his time had come and he simply lay down and passed away. At his request, his epitaph said, the world tried to capture me but didn't succeed. In recognition of his works and numerous contributions, Hrikaurie Skovoroda's portrait was printed on the second largest banknote in circulation in Ukraine, the 500 Hravnia note. We now share with you excerpts from his writings in a conversation among five travelers concerning life's true happiness. God is nature, now God is happiness. Most merciful nature has opened the path to happiness to all souls without exception. Each and every one is born into the world for a good end. And a good end means happiness. How can one say that nature, our universal mother, has not opened the path to happiness for every creature that breathes? In the Bible, God is called fire, water, wind, iron, stone, and countless other names. Why then should he not be called nature? It could be impossible to find a more important and more seemly name for God than this one. Natura is a Latin word. This word refers to everything that is born within the machine of this world. But why not call him in whom the whole world with its birds is concealed, like a beautiful flowering tree within the seed from which it develops, by the name that encompasses all creation, that is, nature? Moreover, the word nature means not only every being that is born and changes, but also the secret economy of that ever-present force which has its center or chief midpoint everywhere and its circumference nowhere like the sphere by which that force is graphically represented. Is this not like God? It is called nature because everything that happens on its outer surface or is born out of its secret, unbounded depths, as from the womb of our universal mother, has a beginning in time. And since this mother to give birth does not receive from anyone, but gives birth of herself, she is called both father and the principle, that has neither beginning nor end, and is dependent upon neither time nor place. Painters represented it by a circlet or ring, or else by a coiled serpent holding its tail between its teeth. The action of this all-present, all-powerful, and all-wise force is called the secret law, governance, or realm that is diffused endlessly and timelessly throughout all matter, that is one cannot ask when it began, for it always was, nor how long it will last, for it will always be, nor to what point it extends, for it is everywhere at all times. Wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? God says to Moses, if through the darkness of matter thou canst glimpse what everywhere was, is and will be, that is my name and my nature, the name is in the nature, and the nature is in the name. The one does not differ from the other. Both are the same. Both are eternal. 
He who sees me through the darkness with the eye of faith knows my name. But he who seeks to know my name knows neither me nor my name, for both are the same. My name and I are one. I am he who is. I am that I am. If one knows God, then whatever name one's worshipful heart gives him is true and good. It does not matter that one person knows bread and another artos, as long as they do not differ in understanding. Moses and Isaiah call him I am. Following them, Paul said the same yesterday and today and forever. And the theologian gives him another name. God is love. What he calls love is the same simple unity everywhere, always, and in everything. Love and unity are the same. The unity of parts is alien to him, hence disintegration is not necessary and destruction is completely ruled out. Jeremiah calls him a sword, while Paul calls him the living word, but they mean the same thing. The sword cuts down everything perishable and all things that become dilapidated, like garments, while the words of his law and kingdom do not pass away. God did not limit happiness to the days of Abraham, to the ancestors of Solomon, or to the reign of King David, to the sciences, or to social ranks, to natural gifts, or to wealth. For this reason, he did not open the path to it to everyone, and is just in all his acts. We seek happiness in our social stations, our epoch, our country, while it is always and everywhere with us. We are in it like fish in water surrounding us. It seeks us out. It is nowhere because it is everywhere. It is like the radiance of the sun. All you have to do is open a passage for it into your soul. It is always knocking against your wall, seeking an entrance and not finding it. And your heart is dark and joyless, like the blink of an abyss. Is it not foolishness and madness to worry about a valuable garland? To what end, as though a man in a simple cap could not enjoy the blessed and universal light to which this prayer flows upward? Hear me, O thou, Holy One, who has an eternal and seeing eye. Is there any more miserable creature than a man who has not discovered what is best and most desirable for him. We have measured the sea, the earth, the air, and the heavens, and have disturbed the belly of the earth to draw out metals. We have traced the paths of the planets. We have found mountains, rivers, and cities on the moon. We have discovered a countless multitude of unfinished worlds. We built incomprehensible machines. Feel great abysses block off and redirect the flow of waters. Every day we produce new experiments and wild inventions. Good heavens, what is there that we cannot do? But the sad thing is that in all this, greatness is lacking. Something is missing that we cannot even name. We know something is missing, but we do not know what it is. We are like an infant that cannot yet talk. It only cries and feels only frustration, without being able to know or to say what it needs. Does not our soul's evident dissatisfaction suggest that all of our sciences cannot satiate our minds? You see the sciences filling the soul's abyss. We have devoured a countless multitude of spinning systems with planets like clockworks on English bell towers. Planets with mountains, oceans, and cities, yet we remain ravenous. Our thirst is not slaked, rather it increases. Enlightened viewers, it's been a pleasure to have your company on today's Words of Wisdom.